Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and today we've got a super interesting and uh, really accomplished lead guitarist with us. We're here with Jason Slim Gamble. Slim's the lead guitarist for the multi-platinum capital Nashville recording artist Lady Antebellum. And they've sold more than, check this out, 18 million albums worldwide, racked up seven Grammys and countless CMA and ACM awards, and they've had nine number one songs. And Slim's been there for all of it, not only as a touring side musician, but also as a session player on every single Paul Worley produced album, and he's appeared as a songwriter on four of their songs. In addition, Slim's performed in the house band on NBC's Last Call with Carson Daly. He's toured with Tyler Hilton and Josh Kelly, done sessions with some of the biggest names in music, and he's found himself on stage with John Mayer, Christina Aguilera, Stevie Nicks, members of Maroon 5, Rob Thomas, Vanessa Carlton, Macy Gray, Peter Frampton, Kenny Chesney, Earth, Wind & Fire, and countless others. Man, I'm exhausted just from reading that. <laughs> it's the, it's the, it's the has, has appeared on stage with that's the that's yeah the resume. yeah yeah that was, that was that was the big one it was like one big one but, congr- <laughs> but man hey and more I, imp- funny thing is i forgot to even admit like doing the uh the charles kelly solo tour like last year which was a huge chunk of my year but you know it kind of all connects to lady a so it's all i'd be nothing if it wasn't for the kelly family <laughs> well that's awesome man well congratulations and thank you for coming on the show man thanks for having me i'm excited got, got a lot of good buddies that have done your show so well, uh, stuff. also, congratulations. Uh, you and your wife recently had your second child, Lila Marie. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. man. She's uh, six weeks old. That's awesome, she's, man. She's just a little Cabbage Patch kid. She's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. So you'll be busy. You won't be getting sleep. Now that you're home from tour, you won't be able to sleep. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's funny. I always think I'll go on tour and get sleep, and then I, you know, don't and come <laughs> home and don't sleep. So it's, eh. I'm just, I, I guess I've never been a great sleeper, so it's it's all good. Well, that being said, Slim is like 15 years younger looking than he, what I would have ever mistaken him for. So <laughs> maybe that's the secret. I've been focusing on trying to get sleep. Maybe I, I got it all backwards, man. I had a whole makeup crew and some lighting guys come in earlier to make me look good. So. It, it worked. Let me Smoke tell you. Mirrors, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, it's very unusual, especially in Nashville for a touring musician to also play on the albums and you've done that all with lady a so my questions are how did you get the gig initially and can you maybe discuss the the, the dynamics at least for yourself you know as to why this situation is so different and what you know that's very rare as you know yeah i think honestly it, it just comes down to friendships i've had for a long time and what what i mean by that is i, I toured with a uh, the lead singer, Lady A, one of them is Charles Kelly, and I toured with his brother, Josh. And so Charles was a good buddy of mine, and, and uh, we'd been hanging out and writing songs together for, for a minute when he and Dave and Hillary put Lady Annabellum together. And um, it was just I, – I came out to Nashville because every time I talked to him, he was talking about this band he had together, and we need a guitar player, and we'll write songs, and we'll live at my brother's house which was a fully furnished 5,000 square foot house in Franklin that no one lived in. So it worked out, but side note. Um, uh, But yeah, so I just, I kind of almost on a whim, just threw my gear in the car and drove to Nashville. And, you know, we hung out and made music and had a good time. And then when it came time that they signed their record deal a couple months after I got there and um, invited me to play on the first record, which, you know, honestly, I never spent a lot of time in Nashville and had never met the producer, but the producer, Paul Worley, um, who's obviously a legend, um, just rolled the dice and they said, Oh, our buddy Slim's a Southern rock guy. Like we should have him on it. And he says, he says, okay. And, uh, you know, and then I, I guess, I guess I, I, I hung in there well enough that the process, the national recording process was different than anything I'd ever experienced. In what and, way? Uh, but in, in, in the way it's very, uh, it's very structured. I got the first email that said, we're doing uh, these dates, tens and twos. I said, what's tens and twos? And that's a, that's a 10 to one and a two to five. Right. And right. that's how they do it. And they, 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 they crank through it and they have a certain way of charting songs, the national number system. And there's just the, uh, the, the process of the day was different because everything is a keeper. I was used to doing records where you go in and track with a full band and the point of the full band is for vibe. So everyone's rocking, but then you go back in and you, touch up parts and you sit there and do overdubs and you like really uh work stuff out and i uh 
I didn't really realize this until after the first record was done. I'm like, wait, I'm not going back to go and go change my parts like that. That that was it. Just completely <laughs> whatever whatever hit me that day. That's what's on the record. <laughs> and uh, you know, lesson learned. <laughs> right, right. You know, it is it is a, a really really fast process, and that's how they've been working in Nashville for for decades and decades. Um, so yeah, it, it was a different thing, and so you know, Paul and and Dave and Charles and Hillary all completely took a chance on me being in the studio, and I guess I guess I, I did a, a good enough job to get invited back for the next record, um, which is kind of another Nashville thing. Is just just loyalty. Like the first record blew up, and they said, okay, well. This is obviously a good team, so we'll 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 do it the same way for the second record, and then, you know, the the next couple kind of same story, and uh, so yeah, that's that's how that came to pass. Like honestly, I I was in the studio with them before I was touring with them because they hadn't toured yet. Sure. Um, so I had like done a couple little spot dates, but um, I was basically like in town. I didn't even officially live in Nashville, but they brought me in the studio, and then they started booking tour days, and I started doing that with them. One thing led to another, and I I landed full time in Nashville. So, um, you know, uh, ultimately that's how that came to pass. It wasn't like I was out on tour with them and we were doing all these dates, and then I ended up in the studio band. It was it was kind of the other way around, and uh, it just ended up where I was doing both at the same time. And also the the other thing was from my perspective as a guy that came from Los Angeles, like that that wasn't such an unusual thing in my mind. I was I was a little bit thrown off by how. I got that question a lot those first few years. It's like, whoa, you're like, you played in the studio and you wrote songs with them too. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a musician. Like we write songs and we, we, we produce and we, we do all sorts of, we do music. Right. But so, it's yeah. not quite that way in Nashville. It is definitely like, there's one set of guys that do this and there's a set of guys that do this and a set of guys that do this. And there's rarely an overlap. I think that that, that paradigm is, is shifting very, very gradually. Yes. But, but ultimately it is still kind of that. So, so I, I just, I'm, I, I got, the short answer is I got really lucky and stuff just kind of fell into place and my friends like invited me to do their record with them and then their record did well. So I just, it just, it just kind of, it worked out in my favor in that particular case, but I, I, it, it is a fortunate thing that I landed on. But you made a comment, you said they're very lucky after they did the first album, they called me back. Isn't that, is that not the norm? If you have a great first album, wouldn't you, would you? Do you suddenly say, okay, let's get some new guys? Uh, I, I don't know because in L.A. I never played on a massive multi-platinum album that was an artist's first album. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, but my understanding of it has always been definitely that, that I know pop artists, like they jump producers like they're changing socks, you know, like, I mean, a lot of pop records now will have eight or ten different producers and writers, so like everything's a different lineup, so... Interesting. You know, I'm sure producers might call the same guys back, but you know, I, I don't know. I never, I never really quite got in those uh, those circles, so um, I don't know. But when I look at liner notes, like yeah, there's there's a lot of guys on pop records and uh, country records tend to be like this is the band for the record, and then you look at the artist's next record, and if it's with the same producer, it tends to be at least a similar lineup. Yes. Uh, once once an artist jumps to a different producer, it's whoever the producer decides to call, you know? Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, to answer your question, I would think it would be that way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You'd think, but uh, you know, pe people, people get bored. <laughs> they yeah. just gotta, so, sometimes stuff, ch stuff changes just for the sake of change too. You know, by the way, uh, you, you, I'm, I'm looking at a wall of slims. He's got a acoustic slash like, it's really hard to focus because I'm just looking at it. I'm like, man, I'd like to play that yellow canary strat. <laughs> and now that's a cool looking telly. And that's a nice looking gill down there. So, so he's got a wall of guitars behind him. It makes focusing on the interview difficult, man. It's very oh, cool. 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 No, it's in a good way. You know, it's like, if, you know, that's not a bad problem to have to have to look <laughs> at that. Um, so you've been with the band since 2008. What's the most? Uh, seven. 2007. Okay, so you've got 10 years. That's a massive, I mean, that's like, you know, 70 dog years. And in, that, and in a band situation, I don't think it's unreasonable to call it that, right? Yeah. Um, what are the most important and most valuable lessons you've learned from this entire experience from, you know, from the get-go, either musically, business-wise, or performance-wise and playing? What are the biggest takeaways been for you? The 
it, gosh, that's 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 a lot of a lot of separate uh, thoughts. But I mean, one of the one of the biggest things that I've I've learned is definitely uh, I'd never really done a lot of sideman quote unquote sideman stuff before this. I'd always played in bands and uh, and done that sort of thing. Or not that sort of thing. That's what I'd always done as a guitar player. I played in bands. Sure. Um, and being a sideman or being a session musician is definitely all about um, you're you're working for someone. And it took me a little while to like adjust to that, honestly. And it's it's good that I was among friends while I was adjusting to that. Um, That's a really honest answer. When you play in bands, is it's a complete band dynamic, and sometimes you don't agree on points, and so you like sift through them. Whereas when you're a side man, like in our in our case in Lady A, like everyone like has their thoughts and everyone has arrangement thoughts and it's a very creative process. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with the artist. Like if 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 you're doing something that's not what they're feeling, like you do what they're feeling. You don't continue to mm. push what you think that it should be. So it definitely that particular thing. I, I remember early on, like it was it was a thing. Like I I, I couldn't cut quite wrap my head around them, where I'd, I'd be thinking like, man, that's that's not a that's not a good way to approach this. But it, it's not my way. It's their way, and that's that's who I'm working for, and they're paying me to do that. So yeah. adjusting to that was something that I said thankfully it it it, it came pretty quick. Um, but figuring that out was one thing and figuring it out musically too. Cause I, I did come into this Nashville based, it's not the countryest thing in the world, but it is a country band and there are just different, different parts being played than what I was used to. Um, I was always kind of a classic rock guy and a classic kind of R and B soul guy. And, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is just, it was just out of my wheelhouse. Um, you know, and, same thing. I, I adapted to it because I realized like, okay, I need to adjust to this because that is, that's what this job entails, you know, being a player that's being hired to do this job. Uh, so that was, that was an adjustment the first few years and, and still is still there's, there's things that come up where I'm not, I'm not a huge effects guy, but that's where the format has shifted like there's a lot of like squirrely sounding effects on a record that I'm going like, okay, I need to figure out how to make that noise, even though my ideal world is a guitar and a cable and an amp. Right. Uh, there's those things that like, okay, well that's that's what is there, and that's what I need to figure out how to do. And so, so I figured out how to do that. <laughs> no, that's a very honest answer, man. I appreciate that. Really, very uh, genuine answer. Um. We talked a little bit before. What else, what else are you working on now that you're excited about outside of Lady A? Man, I've uh, we we kind of just wrapped up our touring year just the other day, but I've got a few irons in the fire. Like there's there's this uh, this musical theater composer um, named Scott Allen that I just recently was introduced to through my my good friend Diana DeGarmo to do an arrangement for one of his songs for his, his one of his solo records and. Uh, the relationship just flourished very quickly and it sounds like we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing some, some production work with him for the rest of his record, uh, which is super exciting to me. And it's for both of us, it's completely out of our wheelhouse and out of our comfort zone. And it caught me completely off guard when he asked me to do it. Cause I'm just going, okay, you must've liked what I did with the first song. And we, we definitely jived really well. Like mm. it hit M- musically, uh, well, musically we're on different sides of, of, of the fence. Um, but I think that's what, that's what appealed to him is that I was bringing a perspective that was completely foreign to him Mm. and he's giving me music that I really have to process and think about and like, how can I steer this more in like my sort of pop mentality? Like, how can I, how can I take this where it's still maintaining his sense of drama and his sense of theater Mm. and make it a little bit more straight down the middle? Cause that's what, that's what he brought me in to do on the first song and and that's what i'm bringing to the table on the on the next batch um but it's exciting to me just be, because like i said it was out of left field and sometimes these things come out of left field and you just like i'm like okay well i'm gonna sink my teeth into this and see what i can do because it's a unique opportunity uh to work on something that doesn't really come along every day so so i'm excited to be doing that um i'm getting a little side project together with a couple of buddies kind of a kind of a, a rock and roll I kind of when I brought it up to these buddies, like I, I you know, the, the the face is crossed with you know the Black Crows and then Led Zeppelin and the faces, and, and yeah, that's a good old band, you know, man. 
Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and just because I was like, I just want to do, I just want to do a cool classic rock and roll band, man. That's, that's my thing. And, uh, fortunately it's, it's coming into the, the long cold winter when no one has anything to do and some buddies were down to, to do it. And it doesn't have a name. We haven't even gotten together yet because our years are still winding down mm-hmm. on our, on our road gigs, but, um, excited to do that. So, you know, check, 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 check my Facebook for details as they come. Um, and the same thing with the Scott Allen project. Is that going to be on your Facebook as well? With the Scott Allen project. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, he's, he, he's got a website for, for himself and I'm sure he'll be keeping people appraised, but like I'll, I'll definitely be, once we really get into that, I'm going to be promoting it just cause it's, again, it's super exciting and he's a very, very well-regarded, uh, composer in the, in, in the theater world. And so I'm excited to just, just jumping in with a guy like that is really going to be interesting and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. Um, and then there's, the, the, I guess the other thing I got coming up is a showcase with a, a, a buddy named Ryan Sims that I just did his record for a producer named Justin Gray out in LA. Um, and, uh, it's a real cool, like roots of Americana rock and roll thing that I got to just Southern rock all over. And, uh, we're as, doing a little, as a player, town. as a player. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, didn't write or produce. I just, uh, they sent me the tracks and I, and I recorded, um, but excited to reconnect with him. He's coming out CMA week, early, early November, doing a little showcase and That's great, is out man. later this, uh, this fall. And, um, so yeah. And, and, and you'll really be on it. You'll be on the up. album. Uh, I, I am on the, it's an EP and I'm, I'm on the whole thing. Yeah. And his name is Ryan Sims. Yeah. Sims. S I M S. Awesome. Check that out, everybody. Yeah. That's so yeah, all sorts of stuff going on. I'm yeah, yeah. Be t- teaching, teaching some, uh, some lessons this fall and, just uh, yeah, just just staying occupied, and then in the meantime, I'm going to be chasing a couple of kids around. Yeah, <laughs> which is you know. I hope the, you the, I hope the, you get the, all the, these things in. What's that? I hope you get all these things in in the in the middle yeah. of chasing all those kids around. I I, I I think it'll fall into place. Like I'm not I'm not going to spread myself too thin. I'm I'm taking on these these really pro- these projects that I I, I can I said sink my teeth into and be passionate about and and the rest of the time just going to be family time because it's when you're when you're a touring musician like it's it's rare those those multi-month periods where you just get to you know hang out with your little kids and watch them grow and just just be around the family be around my wife and just uh so yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a good good few months how many days a year are you out with lady a it's not that bad this, this year we probably hit 100 110 like days, probably I think yeah. 60, 65 shows last year. I think we did 30 shows cause it was sort of a, it was, they, they sort of just, just took a, took a breather and they went and did their solo projects. That's when I did the Charles Kelly project with mm-hmm. him, um, which I, I spent more days last year doing solo Charles stuff than I did with lady a. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's come to a really good place. I think where, you know, lady Annabelle is going to be a, a great touring entity that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably end up doing that. 60 65 shows a year thing and the rest of the time you know because everyone everyone's got families everyone's got kids at this point and everyone's uh everyone's in a good spot so i i I feel like it's you know going going to that place and it's great that's good that's what happens after 10 years of doing something man i'm glad you're getting to take advantage of that it it levels off (laughs) well no i mean you get some freedom which is nice yeah yeah. you've earned some freedom early on it was early on it was really really busy and uh, that's that's how that goes, you know. When success starts, like you, you know, you you chase it, and that's uh, and that's what they did, and they did it really, really well. Mm. That's three people that really understand the business and what needs to be done, and it was a, you know, obviously a massive success for them. And so, um, so yeah, we we did did the grind early on, and now we we don't 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 do the grind anymore. We just go play shows and have fun. That's great, man. Yeah, uh, you're originally from California, right? Originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Oh wow! And most of most of my growing up was was in Colorado Springs. We we bounced around quite a bit, but we got to Colorado Springs when I was eight, and then I moved to L.A. when I was uh, I had just turned eighteen. We should were you in the, dad in the military or something like that? My dad was in construction, so okay, so equal, equal amount of moving in that line of work. <laughs> yeah, sure, man. Any, yeah, any, a lot of bouncing around. So, what was your childhood like moving around from place? You got to LA when you were eighteen. What was your childhood like? Omaha and Colorado Springs, I imagine, both pretty cool places. Uh, Omaha's gotten to be a cool place. We we left Omaha when I was like two and a half years old, so I was I was a uh, too too little to remember. We we were there a lot growing up because uh, my mom's side of the family they're all there, mm-hmm. and my dad's side of the family were there for a little bit, and then they all ended up in in, in Phoenix. Um, but um, but yeah, my childhood. 
we landed in Colorado Springs when I was eight. And before that, I just I remember, yeah, just a lot of a lot of uh, moving and a lot of different places, sure. and a lot of changing schools those first few years. And even when we got to Colorado Springs, we 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 lived in, I guess, three different three different houses. And so I was in different school districts and kind of jumped from from place to place. And, you know, we, we, we finally landed when I got to, I want to say, seventh grade. Um, but even then, like I went to this junior high school that half of the kids went to one high school and the other half went to the other high school. So it was just a constant process of finding myself in new places and, and making new friends and trying to trying to, you know, find my place in it all. And uh, and then and then honestly, like it's funny because high school, like I, I started playing in the jazz band. And so you know, it became a full fledged band geek. And that was sort of like my 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 happy place was was going in the band room and like learning to play instruments and like doing orchestra and just kind of whatever I could do to, you know, avoid everything else in high school. <laughs> how do you think, do you, th- all that moving around in the, you know, it's, it's tough as a kid. How do you think that impacted you good, bad or otherwise as you grew up or even still in maybe how your outlook at th- things or your, your own, you know, family life? You know, I don't, I, I, I'd like to say maybe it may be, uh, you know, excited to travel. Cause I, I, I always, always have been excited to, to see new places and stuff. I mean, it's made me, it's made me appreciate solitude, but it's also made me, uh, not want too much solitude. I think that there's, uh, it's a funny thing because I like, I like my alone time, but there's a, a very hard line that's drawn between alone time and lonely time. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like, solitude is great loneliness is not and it's i don't know how many hours or how many days it is but you know i get to that point where like i need to be around people and uh and i don't know if that's something that rubbed off from all the traveling and moving when i was young and having to make new friends but i mean i'd like to think that having to constantly make new friends like maybe that's made me you know social (laughs) i would imagine (laughs) social because like even when i went to college you know, I moved away and went to California and knew not a soul, obviously, like nobody, and just learned the art of conversation, I guess. <laughs> no, I think that's it's good that you um not a lot of people are comfortable like being alone. A lot some people are like mental about that they can't. You know, it's good that you're you know, you're totally comfortable doing that. Well, like I said, I'm comfortable for a brief period of time and then I then I get mental. No, I get it, man. I totally this, get this it. Last, this last one to the UK that we did, we had a lot of days off in hotel rooms. And the first couple were, you know, cool. I'm just like stretched out, you know, watch, watching Netflix or, or whatever. And then, you know, by halfway through, we were we were just – it was just – it was too much time alone in a hotel room. And as it happens, like we – you know, the, 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 the incident that happened in, in Vegas, you know, just recently, um, that – happened i woke up in my hotel room in amsterdam to go to the airport and that was happening like wow. we were seven hours ahead and so or sorry we were nine hours ahead of vegas so like i woke up and that was active shooter um and we got on a plane and we flew to manchester uk for a day off and we were playing the same arena where that ariana grande concert happened not four months before with the active yeah. shooter in yeah. front of the venue. so oh it was, so that was creepy it was like, it was a big, creepy set of emotions when we got to Manchester, and you know, of course, it was a cloudy, gloomy day, and there's all this. It's like happening. that in Manchester and, every day, though. You know, it's like right? that in Manchester every day. <laughs> and so that happening in Vegas, and you know, the, the plane landed, and there were more people dead. And we got to the hotel, and there were more people dead. And I'm hearing, you know, from buddies that were hiding from someone shooting at them. And then we went and sat in a hotel room and I was sitting there by myself in the hotel room and just like stewing on this. And then Tom Petty died. And it was like, so that's what I'm saying. Like when the, uh, the solitude becomes like just, uh, it becomes this place of idle minds are the devil's playground. Yeah, man. All that going down. And we crossed that line into like, okay, too much solitude. It was a uh, Manchester was a was a tough scene, man. Like it was that that's when like it was funny because I, I remember when when I found out that, that Tom Petty had passed, like I literally texted everyone in the band. I said, OK, that's it. I, that does it, guys. Who's meeting me at the bar? <laughs> and our trombone player, Ray, was the I think everyone else had like fallen asleep or just checked out. But he's like, he says, I'll be there. Like, OK, we just went and just sat and just sort of stewed for a little bit. And I was like, thank I told him the next time, I'm like, thanks, man. Like, I, I couldn't have sat in that hotel room any longer. <laughs> well, it's tough <laughs> so, being that far away. Being by myself, but like, yeah. there, 
there's a line, man. Like I can't, I can't handle it past a certain point. No, I think, I think that I, that's tough in general. Yeah, it's tough it's to be a, like down about something alone. And then when you're alone, not even home, and then you're not even in your own country. It's yeah. It's like, it, it, it was a not, lot. It's not unreasonable. Exactly. Yeah. Totally not but you know, it's, but you know, we, we, we get to, we get through it and then, uh, you know, we got home and the family's here and they were there at the airport with smiles on their faces and you know, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> good, man. Yeah. All hey, that. Gosh. But where, where'd we start with that? Oh yeah. Moving around. Moving around. Yeah. No, you covered it. man. Yeah, probably. Yeah. That was a right. roundabout. We took a scenic route, but no, no, it's totally, there, totally <laughs> there, man. Uh, how did, what was your earliest exposure to music and like, how did that lead you to eventually picking up the guitar and doing what you do? The, the earliest musical memories I have are, you know, probably like everybody, like my parents' records, um, which ranged from Hendrix and the Stones to Barry Manilow and the Oak Ridge Boys. And the two biggest ones, oddly enough, are uh, Kenny Rogers and Neil Diamond. Those were like my wow. parents, all of their records. And those are, those are, those are still like, I still can't get enough of either one of those guys. <laughs> and then there were also, you know, all that other, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival was, was an early thing I remember. I remember hearing Queen when I was a little kid. I remember my, uh, I have this old car. It's a 76 four door Nova that my dad bought new. Those are badass 75. cars back in the day. It, 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 it's, it's awesome. And it's a lot, I mean, that, that car's got just a lot of stories attached to it. But uh, one of them is, uh, it came from the factory with an eight track player. And in, 1982, when I was five years old, my dad uh, went and got a uh, a new car stereo put in with it was a JVC cassette deck, which is still in there. And so, so naturally, we went to a music store in the mall and he bought some cassettes and he bought uh, Rolling Stones, Hot Rocks, mm-hmm. and he bought um, that was the greatest hits if I remember Smash Hits. Yeah, and he bought Toto Four. That's so funny. That so, was their popular album. That was a oh, huge, huge record. Mm. And so that's another one of my earliest musical memories is hearing, you know, Rosanna and, and, and Africa and, you know, Make Believe and like all those great songs on the Toto record and hearing the Stones. Uh, Hendrix, I didn't get when I was five. It was it was later. What made me uh, and this is the rest of the answer to this question. What really made me get into playing guitar that took me over the top like I had a guitar and I learned some chords when I was like 10. There was a guitar class at school and it was just something to do. Um, and then I got into, you know, the, the hard rock of the era, which was Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and, and Poison and all this mm. stuff. But what really, really did it for me was in 1989, MTV was showing Woodstock the movie. It was the 25th or 20th anniversary. 20th anniversary, right. It was in August of 89. And I was in my bedroom and like... I think I, I was probably like playing guitar or listening to, to music or something. And my dad says, hey, you should come watch this. And so I went and watched Woodstock, the movie. And the things that leapt out at me that still probably inform my guitar playing uh, were Alvin Lee of 10 years after. Oh. Rick Havens and his bionic right arm and his massive left thumb. Mm-hmm. And, uh, right over and the top. Those sleep. fingernails. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and the biggest one, you know, what's coming was Hendrix. Yeah. That's yeah. what that's what made me get Hendrix, and then Hendrix just got inside of me, and then that kind of like really was the launching pad for me to just be obsessed with classic rock, you know, like that led to, well, that led to you know Led Zeppelin four on cassette, and uh, just got me totally into just that that hippie music scene, and you know the the floodgates were open, and then like really the the first. The first songs, there was another guitar class in my junior high school, and I went to that, and we we went through the Mel Bay book, Method book. The one. Mel Bay Method book. I, I used to play saxophone as a kid. I remember that. He had them in all music, all oh, instruments. Yeah, everything. And it, it's, that stuff is still like, it's the best stuff for learning basic you know, music yeah. stuff. But, but we, uh, once you got through the book in that class, you could just pick out a song to learn, and then you would learn that those songs for class. And so the, I can't remember the order, but... I, I want to say the first one that I ever learned, the first real song I ever learned to play on guitar, was in fact Stairway to Heaven. There you go. Followed by Purple Haze and The Wind Cries Mary. That's cool, man. That's a my, classic song. Off. Yeah. And, and, uh, but yeah, and so from there, that was just always the stuff that really, really spoke to me. Like I, I got into all the shredders. I got into Ingve. I got into Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. But I think I was at an age where I was just listening to it saying, like, there's just no way that I could do that. Which is the wrong mentality to have, but 
I think it's a good thing because now I, I don't know how to play that way, but I know how to play like Jimmy Page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a bad thing. Because <laughs> I listen to that and it's, you know, it, all that stuff. It's kind of, it's sloppy. You know, it's not like meticulous and perfect. It's just awesome. And so I'm kind of like, I think if I practice, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned Alvin Lee. I, I think he's so, I don't know, he's one of my favorite guitar players. He doesn't come up very much as... Oh, the most underrated guitar player yeah. in classical rock history. I mean, you talk about a shredder. I mean, I wouldn't call him a shredder like, you know, Vi and Satriani, but... That guy, well, it's like like bebop, rockabilly, psychedelic madness, man. Like it's just no one else has ever yeah. played like that. No, no, <laughs> not with that. Not with the not. N- no one else has played blues like that, which is basically exactly. what he did. And he was amazing, man. Great tone and everything. Absolutely. Um, when you first started playing professionally, what was the biggest surprise about the business end of being a professional musician? It doesn't have to be bad. I mean, good, bad, or otherwise. The most surprising thing about the business end. Gosh, I feel like I had an interesting answer for this and I can't remember what it was. Let's come back to that. Yeah, that's totally cool, man. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think of like the, the, the biggest surprise to me. Yeah, let's come back to that. It's all good, man. You know, I wasn't. I I wrote this question down. I wasn't planning on asking you because, again, I thought you were like you know twenty seven years old. But uh, now that I know you're not, I can ask it to you because you'll have probably some good answers. You know, everybody pays tuition in their career, whatever they're doing. And I was curious if you'd be, be open to sharing maybe one or two mistakes you made early on that uh, yeah. you know that's, that that's what a, you learned from them. That 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 that's an easy answer. And this uh this is literally like guided my my life ever since I realized that this was. This is how it works, and maybe this actually goes back to your your prior question about um, about the biggest surprise about the business, which shouldn't be surprising. But um, and I'm gonna <laughs> I keep thinking about this, and I say this like pretty frequently. Uh, uh, be nice, not to to quote to quote the, you know Patrick Swayze as Dalton in Roadhouse. Be nice. No man. Because that's... the biggest mistake that I made early on was just coming out swinging and having to be right all the time about musical stuff, playing in bands, uh, particularly like I played in a band with a, uh, a guy who's still a friend of this day named Joe Firstman. He has a killer, killer band called Cordova's that is just, just, um, just killing it in the, in the Americana scene. But we had a band, it was called Firstman and we were signed to Atlantic records. Um, and he and I, uh, spent several years just butting heads in like just epic, stubborn, like rhinoceros fashion, like we were just both very, very similar, but we were both just complete bastards to each other. And like I just saw him the other night and we're sitting there talking about, you know, th- th- that stuff. And it's kind of like, man, if I could go back and just say things different, like I think about the conversations we had and the way that he treated his band and the way that I was towards him was just it, it was that that band didn't have a chance. And it was yeah. a great, great band. But that was one of those things. And because I'm, I, you know, I can be a stubborn, stubborn freaking person. Uh, but, you know, we were both probably stubborn for the wrong reasons. And I was approaching being in a band as though it had to be some sort of a dictatorship. And I had to like, you know, I had to be right about everything, hmm. which is completely the wrong way to be in a band situation. And uh, and so, yeah, so, it, you know, it all it all fell to pieces. They ended up, you know, the, 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 the band got dropped from the label and they put out the record as Joe Firstman as a solo artist. Um, which that, that's another story. That's to me, in my mind, that was in the, the wake of, of, a, a guy named John Mayer. Uh, everyone was a singer songwriter all of a sudden and rock bands didn't exist anymore. Right. Like just really everything just sort of like mellowed out and became singer songwriter stuff. Mm-hmm. So, but, um, but yeah, so as far as what'd you call it? Paying tuition? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's what that, I, that would be the biggest. The biggest thing to me is uh, is uh, being cool with people and being nice to people and to 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 everybody, regardless of if they've if they've got an attitude towards you or not. Like that is the the, the fact that me and Joe are still friends to this day. It's like you know we've we've both grown up and and figured stuff yeah. out. It's, you know, and it's it's all good. It's all water under the bridge. But you know, that was one of those things. I look back at that band and like that really could have been something. Um, and not just me, like he, you know, he'd acknowledge like he would have had to chill out too, but, um, neither one of us was going to back down. <laughs> uh, and, and we didn't. And, you know, as a result, 
didn't it didn't work out. But it also to to fast forward quite a bit. Um, and this is a story that that Charles tells people all the time, uh, Charles Kelly, um, that I think the entire reason that I have this gig is because. I was cool with Charles Kelly the first time I met him because Charles came out to L.A. when I was playing with his brother. He had just graduated from the University of Georgia, and and he looked like a guy that had just graduated from the University of Georgia, <laughs> like tall, just you know, baggy khakis and a you know pink polo shirt. And he shows up in Hollywood for this. We were playing this show. It was the Joe Firstman a guy named Tony Luca, and I was playing with Josh, and. You know, and he just stuck out like a sore thumb. And Josh had told me, like, he says, man, my brother's like this melodic genius, man. Like, you got to write songs with him. He's like, he's amazing. And he told everyone this. Uh, and everyone was, like, cordial to, cordial to Charles. But he just didn't really fit the Hollywood thing at all. And so everyone just kind of didn't really hang out with him. And I remember we, like, after sound check, everyone kind of went their separate ways. And Charles was just sitting there. And I just walked up to him and said, hey, man, do you want to go get a burrito? There's a Baja Fresh up the street. He's like, yeah, sure. We went down there and just got to know each other and hung out. We ended up, you know, I got together to write songs with him. And he was, in fact, a melodic genius. <laughs> and we we were buddies from that day forward. And he, uh, he came out on the road with us. And, like, we ran around and just partied together. And, you know, he's, he's still one of my best friends. And, uh, you know. I, I look back in that and I'm, I just say to myself, like, wow, what if I hadn't, you know, been cool to the guy that everyone else wasn't really that cool to? And Charles says that all the time. He, he says literally, he says, Slim was the only guy that was nice to me. <laughs> no, but that was probably very good, like, validation, you know, for, like, personal growth. I know, like, when things like that happen, it's, in my life, it feels good because it's, you know, it's a, it's a validation of some growth that you've made on your on your behalf you know oh, totally and i and, and honestly like it's not like i was a dick to anyone at the time really except for except for joe and my bandmates but uh you know i like to think i i'm, I'm generally nice to, to everybody like i pretty much get along with people sure, uh, sure. and they don't all turn into lady antebellum and <laughs> the career because of it yeah but that particular thing it's like they it, be nice yeah like just be cool with people because you never you never know if like the 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 tall gangly you know golf looking dude in the corner of the club in Hollywood is going to end up being Charles Kelly. You know, it's I, I literally had this exact same conversation with. Um, do you know Danny Rader? Yeah, of course. And we were talking about um, he was talking about something. Um, that he had a similar situation and, you know, the big takeaway for him was exactly what you said. It was, um, you know, being right, you know, being nice is basically a lot more important than being right. Yeah. I mean, literally, I mean, it was almost verbatim the same thing. And I, I think it was a, a, a music, it was a music situation. The circumstances were different, but it was a musical situation where it was like a misunderstanding. And I'm not speaking, it was, you know, something you talked about on the show, so I'm not speaking yeah. like personally. But, um... My response to that was that one thing being, you know, nice is more important than being right. For me, that's been the like the I've been married 25 years and that's been the, the thing that is sort of like yeah, that could that can guide a marriage as well. Yeah. We, well, yeah. You know, that was like something that was, man, you know what? It's not that important being right. I want to just I want this thing to be lasting. And, you know, I just need to be be nice. So, I mean, that was it's a that's such a value. You know, it sounds cliche, but it's really important. And I, yeah, it's, it's, it seems obvious, but it's the it's it's important to always be be conscious of that. For sure. Yeah, for sure, man. L let's look at the flip side. Uh, what are there are there one or two particular things you've done, which at the time were a bit out of your comfort zone, that turned out to be really in your best interest? And maybe I mean, this was one of them. Lady Annabellum was definitely one of them. That would be the the, the top of the list. Um, because of the style of music. I didn't realize how art, out of my comfort zone it was at the time um, and how much, when I look at it, how much adaptation that I that I ended up doing over those first first couple of years. And again, if it was around anyone other than my good friends, like it might not have worked out quite as well because they would have been way less tolerant of me just like, I just didn't play the way that people play on Nashville gigs. Yeah. And I, don't like I still don't really fall into that thing, but I can definitely like fake it 
well enough and I can definitely adapt my style of playing. Yeah, I'd say yeah. adapt. I don't think faking it is probably. Yeah. yeah. Adapt would be the better, yeah. the better way to put it. But, um, but yeah, that, that would definitely be at the top of the list. Um, would just be Lady Antebellum, and so it doesn't really get any bigger than that, as far as yeah, outside of my comfort zone. That's that's you know that's that paid of off. <laughs> Whoa, what the? What was that? That's my, you know, like your phone's tied to your laptop. Some like yeah, 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 yeah. It's it, called my phone and my oh, laptop. Your laptop's going off. No worries, uh, man. But anyway, hey, let's talk about some gear. As I'm looking at, like, I got to just ask you that <laughs> Telecaster right behind you, you, over you <laughs> over your over your left ear. What is that? Is that it? Is that an aged relic or is that like an actual? The, the, the second one over. Yeah, with the that with, is a uh, oh that's a, a, a the, guy down in Tucson. It's called Balance, and I think he's oddly enough, I think he's making making mostly like uh, cigar box guitars now. But um, yeah, Balance is the name of his his company, and it's uh, uh, it's just it was a build. It's a swamp ash. Swamp Ash Telly with a it's a, it's a toasted maple neck. Yeah, because reverse that's... strat headstock. Okay, and uh, it, it's great, man. The pickups in there are from a company called Rio Grande. It's a friend of mine in Texas, and uh, it's just a killer, like spanky, filthy Telly. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of my go to. Like, I don't have like a legit country chicken picking Telly because I just I just don't really do that that well. But mm-hmm. that's that's definitely like just a badass rock and roll Telly. And and that is that a proper fender underneath it, the canary yellow? Uh, no, that's uh, that's that and the and the sunburst next to it. I don't know if you can yep, see. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah, Th- those three strats. Uh, this, the 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 blonde and the sunburst are both from a company called Big Tex, down in Texas. Go figure. Yeah, uh, imagine that. that. He, 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 he builds <laughs> strats and tellies and does relic work. But in in my opinion, like he he's one of the best uh, builders that does that kind of thing. Like his necks feel amazing. He oils them with gunstock oil, and they just feel like glorious. And uh, and then the third one is is an actual Fender. It's just an American Standard Telly that I put Rio Grands in, and it's it's my maple neck. It's my it's my white you know Hendrix strat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. amazing. I, I, I don't think a phone call or a conversation I have with a musician goes by where I don't learn about a new boutique-ish guitar company. And it's always like, oh, my God, this thing is amazing. And it's just um, – it's how many guys – it's amazing how many people are – you know. and I think that's a big reason for you know a lot of the sales that in drop-off of, of Fender and Gibson – because you got so many other people that for a few dollars more, they're doing something more custom and, you know, and it's great quality. Yeah, no doubt. You know? Well, and it's in some cases not even for more. If, if, uh, if you were com- comparing those custom builds to like a, a Fender custom shop thing, like it's, it's right. Well, it's less. a lot less probably. And, really, and uh, you know, I, I can't compare quality. I've never owned a, a custom shop, but I've played a couple in there. They're, I mean, they're phenomenal. Like you can't, you can't take away from that stuff, but yeah, people, people are, are, are looking looking to other places because the fact is that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of guys that are building and most of them are really, really great. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's that it's, it, you know, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but I agree though. I think that that's why, you know, you hear about this huge decline in guitar sales. Like, no, you're only looking at like the big manufacturers. It's yeah. not, it's not that no one's buying guitars. It's just that, you know, people have more options. Yeah, and if I'm talking to professional musicians and you guys like you are on the are on the other side saying this is a great guitar, could you imagine what the average layperson is? You know, they're going to be that much more blown away because your standards are going to be a lot tougher. So I mean, it's just there's a lot of good manufacturers out there, man. Yeah, uh, and I mean, competition theoretically should breed quality. So. I think it's great, personally. I'm yeah. I'm a capitalist, man. I think competition's great. You know. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, what's your go-to guitar right now if you have one and what other two or three guitars would round out your, you know, your top ones? Uh, well, I think I, I told you my, my go-to guitars on, on tour would have to be that, that Ibanez Eric Krasno model. Um, which it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, I, I'm not allowed to say this, but it, you know, it's a 335. It's their version of a 335, sure. which they make several. And, um, it's the Eric Krasno. I've got, uh, uh, Seymour Duncan Seth lovers in it. Hmm. And, um, that it's just it's great, man. Like the guys at Ibanez, they they're known for shredhead guitars, but I always forget that you know in the '70s these guys were making arch tops and they were make they're making semi hollows um, for I mean for decades now, and it's it's Japanese craftsmanship which is second to none. So it's they 
be, I feel like because they make shredder guitars too, they've taken this format of the semi hollow and made it kind of less stiff and more playable. Cause for me, like the 335 thing can get a little bit cumbersome. Like the, it's almost an, an acoustic guitar quality sometimes, but, but the Krasno, like it's, it's not super, it's not slinky, but it's just really, really playable. It's very, very well built. And it's actually look at that guitar. So, so it, who is Eric Kras? I don't know that name. He's in a band called Soul Live, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly not, oh, I'm not really familiar with his playing at all. Um, I just thought it looked cool and wanted to check one out, and then I got it. And it's just, it's great. And it's just become a go to. It just feels great and sounds amazing. Um, that and my old, like, I, I got a, a Les Paul Gold Top from uh, like 2000 that I've had since then. And it's just, it's just been raked over the coals. It's just destroyed, but I've done, I've done all the destruction work myself, which is satisfying. Those are my go-to road guitars. My go-to in town studio guitars. Like the, the one I've been coming back to the most lately is this. I just got it not long ago. It was a uh, 68 SG standard. Um, that's, let's see. It's, it's the SG at the yep. far end. That, and then that gold top right there is from 1970. Wait a minute. Wait, that gold top up there, that's not the one you were talking about. No, no, no. That's a different one. Okay. Long story as to why I have two Les Paul gold tops. But that that is uh Whose that, autograph is on there? That's uh Les Paul and Slash. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So that that's always been a go to. I've had that guitar since I was twelve. That was my first like real real guitar. I bought I, I got that from my, my second cousin. Or maybe not even by blood, like my second cousin's husband. For two hundred and seventy-five bucks, when I was twelve. Holy and smokes! How did that miracle happen? It's well, he just he had it, and he knew I was playing guitar and wanted to get an electric guitar. And the funny thing is, that at the time, I was saving my money to get an Ibanez seven seventy because that's what <laughs> was hip at the time. And Les Pauls were like Slash was playing Les Pauls, but it wasn't like my scene right then and there. And so I was like, I don't know. But my my uh, my mom and dad actually convinced me to to get that from my cousin because it was. I, I remember distinctly, like I, I, I offered him two hundred bucks, and he wanted five, and we landed at two seventy five. And I look back on it, it's like I think it over two hundred seventy five dollars, and and it it had it's been routed out. It used to, it, it's a deluxe. It used to have mini humbuckers. It had been routed out. It had these Dimaggios in it, and all of the uh, plastic parts had been replaced with mirrored chrome. And so there's a, there, there's a, a little toggle switch, like a, a coil tap switch that there's a you know hole drilled in it for that, and. Um, I've since it's got like 57 classics in those it are, man I have those on an SG those are freaking phenomenal pickups man I yeah. love those it just, it's ne never 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 failed me that's what's in my other gold top too and I they're, they're 57 right. classic yeah they're really wonderful yeah. I, I like them much better than the burst buckers yeah burst buckers can get a little a little hot a little jarring yeah although actually that, that Rich Robinson has got burst bucker twos and uh they're pretty cool it's, it gives a little little extra howl but um but yeah, those are they, anyway. Those, those are those are some go-to guitars. Like they're, they're I, I've got I've got probably like seven or eight that are the ones that I always take into the studio. That are the ones that really get used. And then there's you know all the other stuff hanging out. That orange one over my right shoulder is actually a, a favorite too. That's a is that's that a, a Yamaha. Oh, it's a Yamaha. <laughs> yeah, it's a Yamaha. It's called a uh, an AES fifteen hundred B, and it's uh it's got the pickups are sort of like. P90 ish, I guess, but it, it it does a lot of different things. It's a really cool guitar. Any cool stories besides the one you just said about the one uh, you got for 275? Any cool stories about some of the guitars you got? Oh, that would be the coolest story for sure. Um, let me look around the room. That that 67 355 is interesting because I actually bought that. I used to work at a music store in Colorado Springs called the Music Exchange, and that was hanging on the wall. And I I, I bought it when I was, I guess, 21 or 22, and got a really good deal on it because it had replaced pickups. There were no covers on the pickups, and so they were you know they were replaced pickups. It had a the, the tail piece was not original to it, and you know those things drive the prices down on that stuff. Um, it needed a refret and you know yada 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 but um so i got a good deal on it and i came just a couple of years ago i finally like i i, I wanted to get the pickup sort of rewired because it had like this this weird middle pickup like the peter green mod this out yeah. of phase thing yeah. Yeah. um which i just it was cool to have but i never used it. i'd rather just have like the actual middle position so i was getting it rewired and while the pickups were out i asked the tech i'm like what by the way i, I was always told that these were non-original pickups 
And I said, do they have like patent number stickers on them? He says, yeah, these are patent numbers. It's all the original solder. He's like, these are original pickups. Wow. To the shop, they didn't actually check. They just saw that there were no covers on them and made the assumption that they were not original pickups. Holy smokes. So it's like it's it's original. I got some some aged covers put on it just for the appearance. Yeah, yeah. still non original parts on the guitar, but it's uh, so yeah. That's one of those funny things. Like I scored a deal because they didn't bother to take the pickups out and look at them. Do, do but you know, they're, they're patent number pickups. So unless someone replaced the pickups with patent with stickers, patents, like, yeah, that would be uh, kind of because the solder's super old, or it was before I got it rewired. But that's <laughs> wild, man. Those. Are, yeah. do, do you know John Shaw? John Shaw, I don't. Yeah, he. I think he, he's Josh Turner's guitarist. He he's in Nashville, and he he's really smart and buys and sells a lot of guitars. And he said that's one of his like been one of his reliable you know ways of getting good guitars. You find something that's old that's had something replaced, and all of a sudden you know because it's not original, the value goes down. But you you know you get it for a really cheap price, and then you know yeah it, you get a lot of equity in there. I think that, that, that kind of stuff is, is drying up because people are, it's funny because like, you always say, oh yeah, non-original pickups, it should like, you know, cut the price down by 20%. But yet you look at listings of that stuff and people selling it don't seem to realize that. <laughs> and people buying it don't seem to care as much as sort of the, the collector snob market seems to think that they should. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Like, I feel like, you know, very few guitars are like actually collectible by collector standards. Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, you know, but that you know, one like, is my sixty-eight SG. Like the guy that I got it from is a good buddy of mine. That he's a vintage dealer down in Houston, and uh, I traded him a bunch of stuff for it, and I, I love it. But he's like, he says, he says, yeah, for me, it's if it's not like a sixty-one, sixty-two, sixty-three, like you know, the, the Les Paul that's not called an SG yeah. yet. You know, that with I guess there's like the 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 nut width is slightly wider. He says, yeah, those are they're just too narrow, and I'm like. And that's that's a collector. He even said he's like, I just I'm such a collector snob. Like if it's not before sixty three, like I don't I don't want it. Right. I'm like it's from freaking sixty eight. It's from the summer of love, man. Yeah, like yeah. that guitar's got stories. Oh <laughs> hell yeah, I know what you mean, man. It depends how your you know depends what your OCD triggers on, you know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, something or someone you miss from your childhood. Oh, I mean that that that's easy. That would be my dad. I mean, he he passed away when I was twenty, and uh, sorry. So it's, thanks, man. It's you know it's <laughs> actually it's funny because it, I guess yeah it's been it's been officially half my life now, mm. and um, you know he was he was always my my best buddy and uh, yeah, it, again it, it, it was a long time ago. But there's there, there's times you know I think like boy I wish my dad was like could see this and like you know I've I've managed to carve out a successful you know career as a musician and. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of really cool things and, you know, would have been nice to share that stuff with him. And now you had your second child, too, which is real nice. Yeah. And it's and, and my, my son, my son's middle name is Gregory, which is my dad's first name. So that's nice. Uh, yeah. But uh, so, yeah, definitely miss my old man. It's all good. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, Slim, what do you think you'd be doing instead? That's an interesting question. I used to do in L.A. I did uh, systems integration work like I, I wired up post-production facilities and it was did like you? it was super technical work and uh a lot of it was you know planning and a lot of it was installation a lot of it was troubleshooting and fixing stuff and i there, there's definitely a, a big part of me that like my brain works that way and like my favorite thing was when something would break and fixing it um so i think i would be doing something along those lines or i would be i grew up working on cars with my dad that's fallen off substantially since he passed like i i mean i just don't do it anymore sure uh, but i might have gone down that road um or i also when when our band got signed i was i was in graduate school at ucla to become a history professor um wow so, those that's a pretty big dichotomy between yeah, working no, that, on cars and building shit and a history professor i know i know it's a big leap <laughs> yeah well it's really different well, yeah, well no, it didn't see that coming did you <laughs> no me a mechanic or history professor yeah and i think I, i'm not sure which one of those would be more or less likely like the History professor, I got through one quarter of it, and then my my our, our band got signed. But I would have had another, you know, almost six years to the PhD, and I'm not entirely sure if I would have survived that because um, it was that's a lot of education. That, that, that few months was it was like I was working full time doing uh, doing wiring work, doing tech work, and I was going to UCLA, you know, full full time graduate school course load, and I was playing in three different bands, and one of them was showcasing for labels, so it was. Uh, I didn't I didn't sleep for that that period of time and like 
you know, I, so I don't, I don't know how, how grad school would have ended up working out. I'm not sure if that was where, where I was meant to be headed. And that's why I think, um, yeah, I, 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 it all fell into place the way it was supposed to. I think we've already come to the conclusion, Slim, that it's this lack of sleep, which is resulting <laughs> in your freaking <laughs> anti-aging regimen or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've heard lack of sleep definitely yeah. helps you live longer. That's yeah. It. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, what was it like to, uh, going to school at UCLA? I mean, that's a massive campus and, you know, a hotbed of, you know, cultural uprising. What was, what was your experience there like? It was, uh, my experience there was very limited. I was there, you know, a couple of days a week and I went to class and then I, then I left and went and read books yeah. and wrote papers. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the libraries. And so is, I mean, the funny thing is like, you know, I went to USC as an undergrad, um, which oh, is the big so cross town rival. Um, but graduate school, like you don't really have time to get involved with campus politics. Uh, I mean, some people do, but I don't know how. Um, so getting involved with, with stuff that goes on on Wait campus. Wait a minute. I'll tell you exactly how. Team, like someone's paying for everything and it's not them. That's exactly how. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're being bankrolled, you can get away with that. Yeah. But if you're, if you're, if you're working to pay your bills and to eat, while you're also trying to go to school, like I think, you know, a lot of people are. Yes. Uh, actually, maybe at this point, maybe not. That was almost 20 years ago now when I think about it. But uh, it's all gotten so expensive that I you almost got to be bankrolled to, to go to, to go get a history Ph.D. to go be a college professor. Like there's no money in that. So you can only go so deeply into debt. But um, yeah, but yes, yeah, so my experience was really like libraries and classrooms and just just. It, it was it's all kind of a hazy blur because I was just so I, I, I came up with so many new exciting tricks to keep myself from sleeping and to keep myself awake, like make it as uncomfortable as possible to sleep because um, I, I, I was awake all the freaking time, man. So that was my experience was just sleep deprivation. <laughs> I hear you. Most important person in your life and why? Oh, it's it, it would be, you know, th three three way time. My, my wife, my son and my daughter. Um, you know, I know I'm, I'm supposed to say, does anyone say not their wife? Does anyone actually like say that? <laughs> um, let me think. I mean, they're the, you dog know, you know, it's they, really <laughs> funny. Like it's, this is very interesting of timing. I cannot tell you how many times I've asked that question and the wife comes walking. It's just like, you know, we've been going for 58 minutes now. No one's here. Right. All of a sudden, you know, the wife comes walking through and it's like, Holy shit! It's almost like the ghost or something, you know. Yeah, uh, and that's frequent. But yeah, usually, usually people say that the wife. Yeah. I'm I'm reluctant to a ask it sometimes because I don't want to force. Oh, you know, no. I want well, I want someone to be honest. But I but it's musicians are weird. Most of the guys that I've spoken to, as like I come from a business background, so most of the guys I've spoken to that are musicians are actually really into their wives. Yeah, well, that's because it takes a, a, a special kind of woman to, 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 to deal with the kind of schedules we keep and the kind of weird lives that we lead. I mean, like you're leaving town all the time. And, you know, quite frankly, like we get to do like our jobs are a blast. Like, you know, the, the, the travel is the, is the tough part and the, the downtime is the tough part. But it's like we go play shows and hang out with our buddies and, you know, drink beer with them and, you know, meet people. And it's like for, from a purely – you know, job standpoint. I mean, it's, that's a joke, man. Like that's not real work. And so there's times, you know, especially when you have little kids that, you know, our wives are home and they're like holding down the fort and taking care of the kids. And like, they have a crappy day and, uh, you know, we're out there like having a blast. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, again, there are, there are dark days. There's tough days on the road, but at the end of the day, no, we're out there playing music. Play music yeah. No, but I think, yeah, for, for, for our wives to, 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 to deal with that and accept that. And none of them accept it fully. Like there's times where it's like, wow, I, I, I'm home. I never, I don't get to do anything fun and you're always out having fun. And it's like, well, yeah, this is my job. Uh, I have to do it. Like I gotta, I gotta keep food on the table, but it's like, no, nah, yeah, I, I, I get it. So, so I think that's, that's why, that's why musicians are into their wives because if they have a wife in the first place, it means they've found someone that really deals with that kind of crap. Um, on some level. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that's I think 
that is mutually ex- my opinion anyway i think everything you're saying is true but i if you're running a business any business your life as an entrepreneur is hectic and and really hectic and busy and some guys are out of town and some guys are not but you're working 18 hour days often and i just see in the music industry i've just been blown away how many guys are 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 so you know openly like you know, just into their spouse. And maybe it's too, maybe it's also an aspect of, you know, creative people in general are probably more willing to express their feelings about a relationship. Yeah, I guess I can see that for sure. But it's always, you're spending a lot of time out of town. You also, uh, there is, there is a certain thing to the, you know, the, the maxim that, that, that absence makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we don't, we don't really get, don't have as much time to get sick of each other. Yeah, man. Very you true. Know, eight months from now when I go back on the road, like it might be a different story. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so, so we'll far t- we we'll haven't talk, had a chance. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, so, yes, your wife and your, three, and your two kids. Most important thing your dad taught you? Uh, I think my dad definitely instilled in me just, just general work ethic and just, uh, uh, you know, committing myself to stuff. I mean, he, he, he – I always remember him telling me, like, if you're going to do something – if you're going to do something half-assed, like just don't don't even bother starting. Um, you know, there's don't waste everybody's time. Uh, so you know, I guess that's made me you know com- commit to things. Uh, uh, mostly in the past, like there's times there's times now that I'm just coasting. It's like it's a, it's a good place to be, and like I not that I not that I don't have any hustle anymore, but I, I definitely spent you know the first uh, you know 15 years of of chasing this stuff like just just going all the time not the the three months of grad school notwithstanding i was still always the guy that was just constantly out and constantly hustling and constantly like go 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 and working and trying to accomplish something um so you know i think i i I had that instilled in me from an early age and you know my dad was a blue collar construction guy and uh so i came from this like you know midwestern catholic blue collar guilt background of like you know you 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 work you get up in the morning and work like we got up saturday mornings and worked on the cars or i mowed the lawn or uh you know stuff like that and so to this day like i can't sleep and like i have even if i have nothing in particular to do like i have to get up and even if i don't do something it's like i can't sleep i have to get up and again back to the not sleeping thing yeah it's, they're just the, vo- the voices I, are just i think we've discovered I, I think I think we we need to pursue this thing here, man. I, I smell info product. <laughs> and how about mom? What's the most important thing your mom taught you? Uh, my 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 mom. Uh, I, I wish this had, would rub off on me more, but my mom is uh, is instilling me to to to, to freaking chill out sometimes. Like uh, you know, my mom's always my mom also has always worked really hard. I mean, I remember growing up like. She would be working full time. Sometimes she would work like a night job and then, you know, get us up in the morning and get us off to school. And oh, like wow. I always remember like my mom – I've told her this recently. Like I don't – there were times like I don't know when or if my mom slept like for years. She looked young? Years. But she was always – she does. She looks very young. Dude, and she has a smile on her face. This is – we've closed this deal. The info like, product. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> um, but uh, – she, I mean, she, she's always done everything with a smile on her face and has like gone through just some, you know, a lot of terrible crap in her life. And, uh, so she's, I mean, she, she's a breast cancer survivor. Like I think 12, 14 years, like a long time, you know, she was diagnosed two years after my dad died of cancer. And so it was a very dark period, but she, she like went through all that stuff also just with a smile on her face. And like, uh, so she's like the most positive influence I could possibly have in my life. And you know, it annoys me sometimes because it's kind of like stop being so positive. Don't sometimes, be so happy. <laughs> like, it is, is awesome, but you know, I, I think just enough of that rubs off where like I can I can find the optimist in myself and mm. and you know find uh, the silver lining. Uh, yeah, totally. So that's my mom's just just all, all all love and all just happiness and just has the such an amazing spirit. And so you know, my mom and my dad are very very opposites from from one another but i mean it's it's a you know good good balance good it seems you got some real very good work ethic uh spirit from both of them though yeah good role models for that which is important big time what's your superpower man (laughs) oh yeah my superpower yeah you know i i I, this is gonna sound stupid but like i i think i'm a freaking great dad like i i think i'm 
Freaking, that's awesome. I think I'm crushing that. <laughs> Good. That's wonderful, man. So that's, that's, that's uh, you know, I, we, we were on the fence about having kids in the first place. Like not cause we didn't want to, but it was sort of like, yeah, we can have kids or not. Like either way we'll be happy. Um, and, uh, I've always loved kids, but, uh, but no, I just, it's just being, being a dad is my superpower, man. And like, I, it's, it's great. That's awesome, man. It's nice to hear. Uh, any hobbies or interests outside of music? <laughs> I, 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 I need a hobby. Not, not really. I used to have a hobby. <laughs> it was, it was playing guitar. It was playing guitar. <laughs> you know what? I asked, you know, Adam, uh, Schoenfeld. Yep. Sure do. Uh, I asked him this question. I said, yeah, I said, do you have any hobbies outside of music? He goes, yeah, guitar. But the whole interview was like that. I was in stitches like the whole time, man. That's amazing. I, yeah, I, I need a, I need a hobby. I'm definitely, I, I'm a, I, I'm a collector. I, I've always liked to collect stuff. And lately that's been a lot of like, you know, buy, sell, trade gear, mm. uh, so it's kind of you know it, it can be an expensive hobby, but I'm I, I'm usually right right around even with the buying and selling and trading stuff. But um, that that's fun. Like I like to like to you know learn about gear and stuff. But uh, no, I, I I don't have what would be considered a proper hobby, and I I need one, and I keep on like thinking I should get one, but I also don't know when I would pursue it right now. So um, you know, one of these days. Yeah, you know, when it's, you know the when this the student's ready, the teacher appears, kind of thing. Right, I'm right. Sure, it'll happen. Hey, you've been all over. Favorite place you've traveled? Hmm. Gosh. I've been asked that and I've thought about it a lot. Like, I, I've never come up with a great answer. Like, there's so many great cities in the world. Like, there's, like, I, I've, I've always, I, I love London. Actually, you know what? I would say my, my favorite places, I, I would say these are my favorite places because they're places that I would be willing to live. Hmm. Uh, there's four of them. I love Ireland. I love, we went to Costa Rica on our honeymoon. Costa Rica is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Seattle. Beautiful there, man. I've been there. Pacific Northwest oh. and Austin, Texas. So those, those are probably my four favorite places that I've, that I've spent any amount of time. What do you like about Austin? Just the music scene there? No, the music scene is, is like kind of okay in my mind. Like there's, there's a lot of like indie stuff and a lot of Texas music and, you know, a lot, a lot of good stuff in there, but not, not necessarily my scene. Like, I don't, I just, I just kind of like the, the energy and the vibe. Like it's just a, it's a strange place. It's, it's getting, Nashville is sort of following Austin in the, you know, there's a lot of high rises and there's a lot of like, you know, mm. and like people moving. Cause it's like, it's a cool city to move to. Um, but no, I, I would just have a really good time there, and I love uh, I love kind of you know, the, the the old houses, and uh, and I, I I do like that there's like a, a full on indie music scene. Like a lot of it is not my cup of tea, but a lot of it is. Um, Man, so, you ever uh, heard of the Rocket Boys? I have not. They're out of Austin. They're a pretty good band. Nice. Oh, sorry for whatever that's worth. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> just curious. I thought oh, you yeah. might have known. <laughs> dork <laughs> dang no, sorry <laughs> I, I, i'm into it <laughs> uh anything you're currently this will be three questions left first one anything you're currently trying to improve on it could be musically personal business anything else uh i i, I kind of uh i i need to i need to get out more and shake more hands and kiss more babies because that was always my thing it's like i was i was always kind of out and about and meeting people and that's where you know uh music stuff comes from and i've i've definitely like I, I've always had an internal homebody, but it's really like when I'm home, like I, I'm home and I want to be with my family and, uh, you know, I just want to like, you know, chill. But, but they, I, I kind of, Nashville has changed in the meantime and there's a lot of new people here and like a lot of scene changes. And so I kind of need to get back out and about. So I want to improve upon that musically. Like I, I always have the intention of, of just practicing more stuff that's outside of my, my comfort zone. I want to get back into playing more like jazz, just just for kicks, just for the sheer like doing something different. And I always go on little kicks where I sit there and like practice bop lines and like, you know, mess with jazz tunes and then get sidetracked. Um, so I kind of want to get I want to get into more of a practice regiment where I'm, I'm just I, I want to be a constantly improving, evolving guitar player because um, it's, it's been like slow progress lately just because like I'm in my I'm in my thing and I, you know, I, I, I play professionally now. And so I, I do what I do and it being a job. Like it's hard to see it as like, oh, this you know, sort of the hobby aspect of it of like yeah. well, I'm an hour a day, like this is this is fun and this is cool. Um 
so I kind of I kind of want to try to get back into you know blocking out some time uh, every day to do that. Whether or not that will happen with the two little kids is anybody's guess, but that's the goal. <laughs> what guitar do you play jazz to usually? I mean, you got a number of them, but which is your? What do you tend to gravitate to? You know, for 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 proper jazz, you know, that that D'Angelico back there. Yeah. How that, are those? I've never played one of those. Uh, they're they're pretty rocking, man. I mean, they're 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 very affordable jazz boxes. Um, you know, that's I mean, that's of course one of the new ones. The old ones cost thirty grand, so I don't yeah. have one of those. But um, but I am actually like I I'm, I might do a, a trade with a dude here in town for a, a like sixty nine ES one seventy five that I hope I hope works out. I think that will motivate me to uh, to do more jazz stuff. Um, is that, but that the point? Like, is that, the, that? The, the sharp point? Yes. Yeah, yeah, those are nice looking. You know, some of those, Dario, they're making new, some of their newer models are like rock. You know, they have one that came out now. It's like a great, it's got a, a British flag or an American flag. And they have another one, like a Grateful Dead guitar, oh, yeah. which yeah, I was they, like. It's a, I think I want to say like Bob Weir signature. Yes, yes, yeah. But I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. I didn't know that about them. I, I have, they, I've never heard one or played one. They're, they're, they're always trying to – like I have a couple of good friends that are actually artist reps for D'Angelico. And they uh, – um, I have two of their guitars and they're, they're, they're fantastic. But they, they want to be known not as guys that make jazz boxes. They want to – because they have sort of you know a, a single cut solid body. You know, I'll just say it's, it's, it's their, their Les Paul, you know, their double humbucker mm-hmm. thing. Um, they have like their 335 style of thing. Yeah, I've seen that. And they're and they're and they're great. Like our other guitar player, Clint, actually has one of those, and uh, and he loves it. So they're 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 trying to rebrand themselves because um, it's you know it's some guys that bought the name. You mm. know, it's the original company. Uh, uh, I didn't know. I, and I said to Dario, sorry, I meant D'Angelico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I knew what you were uh, what you were talking about. Um, but yeah, so they're they're trying to be known beyond the jazz arch top world. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like they make really great jazz arch tops. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it, that's, 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 it, it could be tough to overcome, but I know a lot of guys are starting to really, really dig on their, uh, their, uh, their, their 335 style center block things. And, um, I don't know anyone that has one of the solid bodies, but, uh, you know, who knows, hmm. but they are making all kinds of stuff. Toughest decision you've ever had to make or the hardest thing you've ever had to do so far? Uh, man, I, I, as far as tough decisions, like I haven't, I haven't run into one of those situations where it was kind of like a life and death decision, honestly. Like I, I was thinking about that and, uh, I, I didn't come up with, with anything huge. Like I'd like to say, oh, moving to Nashville, but it's like, I, I've always, I've found as much as like, I, I tend to be really intense and I overthink everything like i am the ocd overthinker crazy person like that's one of the things that keeps me up at night like i overthink every damn thing so like in my mind everything's a life or death decision but uh i never make any of the decisions like stuff for some reason for me at least has always sort of shown itself where where it just becomes like so obvious where it's like okay that's what i should do and there's times when just like Something comes up where it seems difficult, but I'm kind of like, no, obviously this is what I'm going to do. Like where I just feel it. I'm kind of like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. That's That's great. I'm happy that you haven't had to be in that situation, man. That's why you're so damn young looking. (laughs) (laughs) We'll get to the bottom of this by the end of this call. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a lot less stress when you, although you said you're, you analyze everything, which is a lot of stress. Distress. Yeah. Yeah, it's, It's a lot of stress. I'm not lacking for, for, for stress. I just I'm, I make a big deal out of out of things that shouldn't be a big deal, probably. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of people do that. Yeah, yeah, it's typical. Last question, man, uh, and you've been real, real pleasure, and I'm really glad that I know it was really hard to connect. I'm really happy that I appreciate your time. What's your definition of happiness, bearing in mind that changes, of course? Gosh. Definition of happiness. It's like, it's such a... I, I, Happiness really does. I remember seeing, you know, the comic Dennis Leary had this this He's record that I, that I just wore out when I was, you know, a teenager called No Cure for Cancer, and mm-hmm. he had this uh, he had this this one little bit. He says, "Happiness comes in small doses. It's a it, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's an ice cream cone. It's a five second blowjob. It's like it's it's the little things that you have brief bits of happiness. Wait a minute, five seconds. The rest of it." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
and I and, and it's it's always so because it's like it's funny you know his delivery was like ah oh, that's really funny but it's like no it is like there's it's all those like little moments that like that's happiness it's not like there's no in my mind for me it's not like some broad sweeping like ah everything's awesome because stuff always comes up that's a pain in the ass it's a big freaking drag like you sounded just like him right now when you said that that sucks no i i, I i'm a ranter <laughs> you sound just like him when you said that that's a it's big a, freaking it, well it's it, it's it's true because it's like you know just when everything is like settled and content, you know, life pops up and like there's some stupid thing you got to deal with and it sucks. But then you deal with it and then like, oh, you're, you know, your kid runs across the room and gives you a hug. It's like, that's freaking happiness, man. Like that's happiness. Or like, you know, or I walk away from a show saying like, hell yeah, I entertained the shit out of those people. Like that was great. You know, I'm very happy right now. Or, you know, the first sip of like a really badass local IPA, you know, I say, damn, that's I'm very happy. I'm happy. Right? I feel really good. Or just, you know, every whenever I come home from a trip and like, you know, the, the family's, you know, happy to see me because they missed me. Like it's it's yeah, it's, it, I think it's it, it's it's all of those like little moments of just like that surge of of, of just gratitude hmm. that, that that that's 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 what happiness is to me. I don't think it's some like massive broad sweeping concept, at least at least for me, it's not because, you know. There, there's it, it's that that's too grand of a concept because there's too many things that that are out there trying to take away from people's happiness to just say like I'm just I am happy all the time um, but I guess the way to to have consistent happiness is to like accept that those things pop up deal with them at the time and then get back to finding moments of happiness uh, that's a real good answer, but you know, uh, it's like that line that uh, you want to make God laugh. Tell him your pl- or whatever your spirit entity is. You know, tell him your plans. You know, it's always I, you're right. A, I, I always, I actually always reference that. I, I, I heard it as a Yiddish proverb. I also heard it attributed to Woody Allen, but <laughs> I, so I don't know where it came from. But it was just, it was it was simple. It was just man plans. God laughs. Yeah, yeah, right. It's true. Very true, man. And I say I say that all the time whenever we're trying to like get out of the house and go do something, and it takes forever to wrangle the kids, and then it just doesn't go as as planned. And then it starts <laughs> raining. Because <laughs> man, it, pl- it, man it, what is it? Man plans and God laughs. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a very concise way to uh, that to is say. It. Very concise. <laughs> hey, man, what? Uh, where could people find you online? And and you know anything you want to promote at all? Man, I, I'm I'm excited. I would say uh, anyone that wants to see what I'm up to, like I'll just check in on 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 the old book of faces. Um, if you search Jason Slim Gamble, G A M B I L L, I can't even remember what the actual you know backslash is. But if you search, I think if you put in Jason Slim, it'll probably be the first thing that comes up. Yeah, I don't uh, think there's hundreds I, I of Jason like Slims. That. When I'm, uh, yeah, when, I, <laughs> when, I, when I'm when I'm doing something, I'm I'm especially this stuff coming up. The the Ryan Sims project, the the Scott Allen project is is hopefully going to end up you know coming together and going to be a, a big big cool thing for me and uh, and my, my my personal side project, which which I I haven't I haven't been able to say in, in quite a few years. Like oh, I'm putting a band together and, and trying to do something. Uh, so so yeah, that'd be the way to the way to to keep up with stuff and um, you know, and I'm uh, always always uh you know teaching and doing Skype lessons and all that stuff. So same thing. The, the easiest way to access me is through, I hate to say it, but, but through Facebook. <laughs> no, that's great, man. So yeah, that's great that, you know, if you could take a lesson from the lead guitar player from Lady Antebellum, check him out online. Or if you know he's a great player already, just go to, go to Facebook. That's a pretty good opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm easy, easy, to, easy to find on there. Um, man, and if you come out with an album, just come back on the show. And let's discuss it because the show's growing and I'd love to yeah, promote for it. Sure. I would absolutely yeah, love I'm, to. I'm, when it's, uh, Open a little side project. I'll, uh, we'll turn into some recording and just kind of, you know, Great. be able to say, "Hey, look, this is my thing." <laughs> awesome, awesome. I'd love to promote it, man. Absolutely. Hey, listen, you've been uh, really, really good to talk to and get to know, and I appreciate your time. And uh, I'm really glad you're back home. You get to enjoy yourself for a little bit in your uh, family. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's been a, been been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Likewise. All right, buddy. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview, with Jason Slim Gamble, as much as I did. And by the way, that is such an Oklahoma name, Jason Slim Gamble. I mean, like, or, or no, you said it was Nebraska. Sorry, when you said I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, I'm like, fuck, that makes so much sense. Oh, that, you should have. I could just all over Oklahoma also when I was a kid. So it's funny you. 
uh, you know, I could just see like hundreds of guys called like Slim Gamble walking around up there with cowboy boots and jeans. As soon as you said that, it was like, ching, you know, my whole, I saw them all right in front of me. Uh, anyway, man, thank you again for all your time. I really appreciate it. And thanks for being so uh, open and honest and transparent and vulnerable and all those good adjectives, which you are. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com and sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some other cool stuff. Be nice. Be nice. There you go. Be, go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, I'm out. And thanks for listening. Peace, y'all. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.